adaptations, a concept we are all too familiar with in today's day and age. We've seen book to comic book, book to movie, movie to book, and so on. However, there's a certain form of adaptation that is usually seldom talked about. A form of adaptation that has truly untapped potential in my opinion. Now, you may have heard of book adaptations of video games. God of War, Assassin's Creed 2, Resident Evil 2, you know, retellings of the story of the game through writings and words, you know, like a book. The 2018 God of War novelization I actually have a pretty funny story with. You see, for my AP literature class, I had to read two books over the summer. One that was required of me and the other one was a book of my choice. Now, I read the one that was required of me. The, the Crucible is a great read, honestly, I'm not that stupid, but I chose God of War 2018 as my book of choice. However, halfway into reading it, I was kind of just like, fuck it, and replayed the game again. No one noticed, and I had the physical book, so there was no way of knowing that I didn't do it. So thanks for not being super strict, Mrs. Rice. I love you. Anyways, video game adaptations of books are a concept I find interesting. There's only a handful of great one-to-one -one adaptations, and as I stated before, there's serious untapped potential here. So uh, sit back, relax, as we go over the relationship between books and video games as a medium. Now, unlike video games, books are much, much older, obviously. We've been writing shit in pages since before Fortnite. Now, I know that seems like a million years ago, but it's true. However, the human race has been adapting stuff since ancient Greece. Classical Greek playwrights would adapt myths that had traditionally been passed down orally. Then after thousands and thousands of years, all of a sudden, humankind had been the bestowed the gift of cinema. The art of combining a bunch of little pictures into making a moving picture. Fucking crazy, I know. Now, making moving pictures was neat and all, but there was a slight problem with this new medium. We didn't know how to tell stories, really. We kind of got the gist of it, but the majority of filmmakers weren't really great storytellers quite yet, so the movie industry sought to playwrights and authors for inspiration. And so, the art of adapting films into books began. 1899 saw the first adaptation of a book via the short story Cinderella. You may have heard of it. A French-directed film by a person I'm not going to say because I'm really bad with names. And of course, being based on the fairy tale of the same name. Then, over time, we saw a trip to the moon in 1902 which was loosely based on two separate novels. Then we also saw Alice in Wonderland in 1903. The point being that cinema started collectively getting a feel for adaptations, realizing that sometimes it just does not work. Case in point, 1924's Greed, a film by Erich von Stroheim that was supposed to be a one-to-one -one recreation of the novel McTeague, A Story of San Francisco by naturalist author Frank Norris. Von Stroheim was adamant on making this film as faithful as he could to the novel, clocking in the original cut of this film to be nine and a half hours long. The film was cut down into just under two hours, however, there have been cuts of the film that have been restored into at least four hours. Needless to say, adapting books to film is hard, and while it has been done pretty well before in some cases, others not so well. But let's take this adaptation knowledge over to the video game side. Nine hours of pure story is nothing. The first Last of Us averages around 15 hours total. Now, of course, that involves firefights, exploration, constant deaths, and hidden PlayStation 3 loading times, but still, games are getting to the point where stories can be told at a vast scale. The entire Mass Effect trilogy averages around 70 and a half hours until completion, at the very least. If you were to read the first five Game of Thrones books straight, it would take the average reader 17 hours. That is nothing in comparison to video games. So this leads me to a question. Why do we not have many video game adaptations of novels? It's the perfect medium for it in terms of faithfulness. Only television can really come close, but even that has its fair share of drawbacks. Now, I'm not here to say that this is a foolproof way of adapting novels. There are most likely a ton of things that need to be taken into consideration, but bear with me for just a moment and let's go over the relationship between books and video games. The Metro Game Series. These pseudo-horror first-person shooters tell a gritty, post-apocalyptic story of Russian survivors that live underneath in the Moscow Metro tunnels. The series has three notable games in part. 2010's Metro 2033, 2013's Metro Last Light, and 2019's Metro Exodus. However, the Metro series did not originate as a video game. 
The series takes place in a universe created by Dmitry Golfohosky via the first Metro book, Metro 2033. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the only direct one-to-one -one adaptation from book to game is seen within the first book and the first game, but there are many noticeable differences between these two in terms of story. Many of the characters in the book make appearances in the game, but are supposedly dumbed down quite a bit and lose a lot of their individuality. The factions and socio-political elements are explored far more in the book. People are also portrayed differently in the book. It's all about survival, so many join these factions for a sense of security and safety, whereas in the game it isn't explored as much. The book also brings in several other factions, such as cannibals, a group of Jehovah's Witnesses like people, and a group of satanic worshippers trying to dig down to hell. The last thing I'll mention about these games is that a lot of the set pieces are absent from the book. After this game, however, the series seemed to kind of just do its own thing, and the book series has many different writers introducing many different tones and genres, and the games just explored their own stories. Now, my experience with these games is very limited, so I'm so sorry if I got any of this information wrong. Please feel free to make any corrections in the comments down below. That honestly goes for any game on this list. Personally, the most interesting game on this list for me is 1995's I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, a point-and-click adventure game developed by Cyber Dreams and the Dreamers Guild. The game is based on Harlan Eliasson's short story of the same title. It takes place in a dystopian world where a mastermind artificial intelligence named Am, or Am, I don't know, has destroyed all of humanity except for five people, whom he's been keeping alive with torturing for the past 109 years by constructing metaphorical adventures based on each character's fatal flaw. The player interacts with the game by making decisions uh, through ethical dilemmas that deal with issues such as insanity, R word, paranoia, and genocide. Now, the post apocalyptic science fiction short story was first published in the March 1967 issue of If Worlds of Science Fiction. It won a Hugo Award in 1968 and was featured on many different collections of short stories in a similar vein. The game was actually shepherded by Elias and himself, who wrote the 130 page script treatment alongside David Sears. Eliazin also voiced the supercomputer AM and provided artwork of himself used for a mouse pad included with the game. So instead of being a traditional book that was dumbed down into a video game, it was a short story that needed to be expanded into a full-fledged interactive medium. Though a commercial failure, it received critical praise and many rewards, including the best game adapted from linear media, adventure game of the year, best 15 sleepers of all time, and 69th best adventure game ever released. Much like I have no mouth and I must scream, the Call of the Cthulhu games are based on a short story rather than a full-fledged novel. I'll start with Call of the Cthulhu's Dark Corners of the Earth. Now, if you're familiar with my channel, you may have seen me address this game before. What you also may have realized is that I just lied to you. I lied to you, to your face. How do you feel? How do you feel right now? This game is actually a reimagining of H.P. Lovecraft's book, The Shadow Over Innsmouth. Now, the only reason why this game is called The Call of the Cthulhu is just because it's based on the Cthulhu mythos, I guess. Dark Corners of the Earth is a survival horror video game developed by Head First Productions for the Xbox in 2005, as well as Microsoft Windows in 2006, I guess. It combines an action-adventure game with a realistic first-person perspective, as well as dashes of a stealth game. It also contains elements of the Call of the Cthulhu tabletop role-playing games campaign, Escape from the Innsmouth. A major subplot of the game is also inspired by Lovecraft's novella, The Shadow Out of Time. However, Head First Productions went bankrupt, and we wouldn't see another Call of the Cthulhu game until 2018. Remember that year? Call of the Cthulhu is a role-playing survival horror video game developed by Cyanide and was published by Focus Home Interactive for Microsoft Windows, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and as well as you guessed it, the Nintendo Switch. The game features a semi-open world environment and incorporates themes of Lovecraftian and psychological horror into a story that includes elements of investigation and stealth. Call of the Cthulhu received mixed or average reviews with the general consensus being that while both graphics and atmosphere were great, the game's progression is, is not well implemented with unclear story elements and poor RPG mechanics. Perhaps the second most interesting game on this list for me is 2010's Dante's Inferno, an action-adventure hack-and-slash game developed by Visceral and was published by EA. The game is essentially EA's response to the Sony's God of War franchise. I remember getting this game for a PS3 and not knowing how the hell to play it. I was kind of just 
too young and dumb to understand. And the game is actually considered to be pretty difficult too, so I just, I just had no chance at all. I also remember watching the animated film that was associated with the game. I don't know how the hell I watched it, it kind of just sticks in my mind because there's boobies in it, but you know. When Visceral Games, the studio responsible for the Dead Space franchise, had been wrapping up the Simpsons game, creative director Jonathan Knight approached his boss Nick Earl about creating a new franchise, and they decided to base this new franchise on the work of poet Dante Alighieri. The game that would become Dante's Inferno evolved from early prototypes into just a single story that is loosely based on Inferno, the first canonical of Divine Comedy. Dante is reimagined as a Templar knight from the Crusade, who is guided by the spirit of the poet Virgil, and must fight through the nine circles of hell to rescue his beloved Beatrice from the clutches of Lucifer himself. According to a totally real survey I didn't make up, most of the people that played the game said, yeah, it's alright. Not particularly bad, but not nearly as revered as God of War. Now, the game is not very faithful to the adaptation of the Divine Comedy at all. A former president of the Dante Society of America, which is a real thing I guess, criticized the game for the depiction of Beatrice, stating that, Of all the things that are troubling, the sexualization and infantilization of Beatrice are the worst. Beatrice is a human girl who is dead and is an agent of the divine. She is not to be saved by him, she is saving him. That's the whole point. She became the prototypical damsel in distress. I don't know why she's British. I just kind of, that's just kind of how I envisioned it. Another very interesting game I found while researching this video is 1995's The Dark Eye, a first-person psychological horror adventure game developed by Inkscape and that was published by Warner Interactive Entertainment for the Windows and Mac. Don't know why I said the Windows, but that's cool. The game features 3D graphics, stop-motion animation, video segments, and nightmare feel. I mean, come on, just look at this shit. Now, The Dark Eye combines the stories of three different Edgar Allan Poe tales. The cast of Amontillado, The Telltale Heart, and Bernice, all from the perspectives of both the murderer and the victim. A new story was created in this, for this game to weave all three tales into this uncanny video game. The story follows an unnamed protagonist who's suffering from surreal nightmares. He's about to witness the tragic events involving his brother Henry, Henry's fiance, and Elise, who is, dis who is his disapproving uncle. The game was designed by Rebecca Barrent. I am saying Rebecca Bear and I swear. Known for a trilogy of games with the same style of claymation. Bad Day on the Midway, Evil Prevents Adventures from the Smart Patrol, and the game we are discussing now, The Dark Eye. Now, I don't know about you, but these games look fascinating as hell, and in all honesty, I wouldn't mind making a video about all three of these games, but I'll save that maybe for another time. In terms of reception, the game may have well just not have exist. It attracted little attention from either critics or consumers. Jeffrey Adams of GameSpot gave the game a mixed review, criticizing the game's lack of explanation for gameplay mechanics or goals, but still regarding it as one of the most original computer games ever created. But Patrick Arlano of Blasting News hailed it as one of the most best and obscure horror games of all time. Now these next games aren't necessarily adaptations of their book counterparts, rather these are just continuations of the books, which I find very interesting. Instead of continuing the story via more books, they continue the story by transitioning to our beloved interactive medium, which is bold. To begin, let us start with The Witcher is a very interesting series in terms of its role in the video game industry. A lot of people played The Witcher 3, but I guarantee most people have not even touched the first two games. Now, that's not to say that they're bad games by any mean, I mean, they're definitely not, but they show their age. I just find this interesting due to how revered the series is, so much so that it gets its own Netflix series. Anyways, the first game was developed and released in 2007 by Polish game developer CD Projekt Red. These games are based on the fantasy novel series The Witcher by Polish author... Here's the thing about The Witcher. It's not a one-to-one -one adaptation of the story. Rather, it takes place after the events of the main saga. The author of the series also didn't work on any of the games in any meaningful way other than just kind of establishing the world and lore. Also, I'm sorry, I don't have that much experience with The Witcher series either, so I'll just kind of allow amply titled Reddit user deleted to explain. Spoilers, maybe? Geralt's characterization is greatly changed in the games. He's boating and philosophical while also more vocal in the novels. The book greatly emphasizes that he's conflicted about his emotions or false beliefs that there is a lack of them, and how he hates being a witcher. 
It's poor work and there are a lot less monsters than compared to the games. He struggles to find work for contracts. His friends even make fun of him later because of his sulking. The games elevated his status to that of a badass warrior. Siri also isn't a Mary Sue as she is shown in the games. She suffers a lot. The relationship between Siri and Yennefer is vastly more important in the books. She's her pseudo mother and they call each other mother and daughter. Yennefer's personality is also different in the main saga. While the games reflect her characterization in the short stories, she's supposed to be more loving in regards to Ciri and Geralt in the main saga. She even helps women with their pregnancies, increases the price of Geralt's contracts without his knowledge, and saves a dwarven family from a race riot. Triss's relationship with Geralt isn't as important as it is shown in the game. Her love is unreciprocated and Geralt regrets sleeping with her. Dandelion is much more of an important character in the novels. He's humorous and somewhat of a coward, but not a nuisance as he is in the game. He acts as a dear friend to Geralt when he's often down or brooding. The them of destiny is much more prevalent in the books, especially involving Geralt, Yennefer, and Ciri. Signs are less powerful and used less frequently. Now the author has gone on record stating his distaste for the games for many different reasons. He's butthurt because the games are way more popular than his books ever were, thus leading people to believe that the licensing relationship was backwards, and that he created the books for CD Projekt and expanding the universe. He's also gone on record dissing most of the players for not learning about the series through the books, calling us all dumbass little baby gamers. Now, keep in mind he doesn't speak a lick of English, and this could be mistranslated in terms of wording and tone, but it is evident that he doesn't like the games, so yeah. Parasite Eve is an enigma of a game. It is a 1998 action role-playing survival horror game developed and published by Squaresoft of Final Fantasy fame. However, the name and initial story actually belongs to the 1995 novel Parasite Eve, a Japanese science fiction horror novel written by Hideaki Sena. Now, this game is strange and notable for many different reasons. For one, it is a sequel of sorts to Sena's book that he had absolutely no say over. Hell, he didn't even know anything about the game's story until the game was essentially complete. Primarily because it wasn't his idea to make the game, it was his publisher's. Secondly, from Square's point of view, this was their response to the survival horror slash J-horror craze that took over the 90s. Squaresoft, the guys that rarely follow trends, rather they usually are the trend setters. But if you want more on that subject, you should check out my video on PlayStation 1 Horror, you yeah, know, right there. I'm fucking watch it, bro. Sina had a background in pharmacology, and his day job prior to being an author consisted of testing mitochondria with various drugs. Later, he had seen a television documentary that got him to think about the idea that the mitochondria could possibly have a will of its own, and what would happen if it did not feel like keeping up its end of the symbiotic relationship. An incredibly fascinating concept, I know. This would be the basis for what the book Parasite Eve is. Now, from what I can see, the novel largely takes place in Japan, where antagonist Eve had been waiting for the perfect conditions for mitochondrial life to essentially become sentient and gain independence. Eve can control people's minds and bodies by signaling the mitochondria in their bodies to either think certain thoughts or make them undergo spontaneous combustion. Anyways, a ton of events occur in the book that I'm not going to get into here. Really, the only thing that you need to know is that Eve and all of her samples die in the book, but are brought back in the game because, you know, plot. Now, the Parasite Eve game revolves around the protagonist, Aya Brea, who is a New York City police officer, as she attempts to stop Eve. You know, the, the, the woman who plans to destroy the human race through spontaneous com human combustion. The player explores levels set in arenas of New York while utilizing a real-time combat system along with some RPG mechanics. The setting of New York is actually very interesting for many different reasons. For one, New York was one of the settings considered for Final Fantasy VII back in its pre-production days. I know, shit was weird. Secondly, Parasite Eve had a decent number of American staff members, with a large part of the game's production taking place in America. The creation of the main character, Aya, also has ties with Final Fantasy VII. According to Tetsuya Nomura, Aya was originally being designed by someone else on the Square staff, but the original sketches did not satisfy Hironobu Sakaguchi, who is the producer of Parasite Eve. Sakaguchi had wanted a long-haired character like Aerith Gainsborough from, you guessed it, Final Fantasy VII. Somehow Nomura was put onto her design by accident, I guess. Apparently Nomura was creating another unspecified character for a different project who sported short hair but got confused while designing them and accidentally combined the two designs. Supposedly Sakaguchi liked the design and the rest is history. This really has nothing to do with the video, I just thought it was interesting. You know, it's my video, I'll do whatever I want with it, alright? Like what are you gonna do about it? 
Anyways, Parasite Eve is a very interesting game that deserves more recognition amongst the likes of the JRPG horror genre. We received positive reviews and has a dope ass name, soundtrack, setting, and tone. Would highly recommend checking this game out alongside its sequels, especially The Third Birthday. The Lord of the Rings, a three novel epic that tells the story of many different characters. Frodo, Gandalf, Aragorn, Gollum, you know, modern day celebrities. There isn't anything for me to say here. I mean, Lord of the Rings is responsible for almost everything fantasy. So even if you don't even know the slightest bit about its story, you definitely know more than you think about its lore. Trolls, knights, dragons, elves, dwarves, dark lords, magic, it's all there. And it's all because J.R.R. Tolkien shaped and popularized the genre within his writings. You could say that all of these fantasy games are indirect inspiration from The Lord of the Rings. The Elder Scrolls, namely Oblivion, the Dragon Age series, and almost any game where knights go shing and dragons go Now, what has The Lord of the Rings brand offered to the video game landscape? Well, tons of games, actually, ranging from turn-based RPGs to large battlefront-like war simulators. The most notable games in part are Middle-earth, Shadows of Mordor, and Shadows of War. In 2014, one of the new main next-gen games was Middle-earth Shadow of Mordor, an action-adventure game developed by Monolith Productions and was published by Warner Bros. Interactive. This game is notable for many different reasons. For one, the Nemesis system, which allows the artificial intelligence of enemies to remember their prior actions against you as the player. If you've never played these games before, you might find this to be like a weird too good to be true system, but it's real. I remember distinctly playing this game way back when it came out, battling an Uruk chieftain who was seconds away from taking my life, only for another chieftain to come across and attack his clan, allowing me to escape, recollect myself, they dished it out, and I killed both of them. These games are incredibly dynamic, and the Nemesis system is awesome, which is why it's such a shame that certain actions have been taken to prevent it from being done in other games. Seriously, this system warrants its own like video game genre, because it's that awesome. In terms of story, the Shadow games are quite interesting. It is an original story not created by Tolkien, so it's not necessarily canon, but it is based on Tolkien's Legendarium, which is essentially the unpublished Middle-earth writings and work he created in his lifetime that formed the background to The Lord of the Rings, which his son Christopher summarized in his compilation of The Cimmerillion. The Legendarium's origins reach back to 1914, when Tolkien began writing poems and story sketches, drawing maps, inventing languages, as a project to create a unique English mythology. That leaves us with our protagonist, who is named Talion a Gondorian ranger who's bond with the wraith of an elf lord, Celebrimbor, the guy who forged all the rings. The two set out to avenge the deaths of their loved ones. The story also takes place in between the events of The Hobbit and The Fellowship. And so thus concludes the games that add to the lore of previously established books. Now, I know I've surfaced many different games here so far, but I think I'd be remiss not to mention games that have been heavily inspired by books. I don't necessarily want to get super in-depth with these games since that requires a deeper understanding of each individual story, and I already explained as many games as I could without getting into the main nitty-gritty of their stories. I mean, it's just the nature of books as a medium. You really can't talk about them without mentioning the main meat of what it is trying to say. Nevertheless, Tran... Bioshock, the action-adventure first-person shooter that brought the games industry to new heights. Bioshock is almost exclusively about the works and fiction of Ayn Rand. The Fountainhead, Atlas Shrugged, Anthem. Alongside Rand, creator Ken Levine also introduced the likeness of Aldous Huxley and George Orwell because of their distinct utopian slash dystopian writings. On top of that, Bioshock Infinite was also heavily inspired by The Devil in the White City. Now, if you want more on Bioshock, might I recommend the video I made with my brother where we talk about the game and its story thoroughly. God of War might be a cheap entry on this list, but I wanted to include it anyways because, well, I'm on a God of War high with the release of Ragnarok and whatever, so who cares? As I'm sure you can guess, the God of War franchise pulls from many different writings of the ancient Greece and Norse mythology, including almost every single story seen within each mythology, in some way or another. The Ass Ass Creed games pull from several books and writings. According to producer Jade Raymond, the first Assassin's Creed was inspired by the 1938 novel Aliumut by Vladimir Bartol. I mean, hell, a line in the novel 
nothing is absolute reality, all is permitted, is used nearly word for word in the game. Nothing, nothing is, is true, true. Everything, everything is permitted. Is permitted. On top of that, much like God of War, Greek, Norse, and Egyptian mythology are also used in the later games. My dearly beloved Bloodborne is Lovecraftian, cosmic, horror at its finest. So much of this game pulls from H.P. Lovecraft's books in so many ways. Madness, the one to obtain godhood, the fishing hamlet, the moon presence, the old ones, eldritch impregnation. I mean, even if you only know a little bit about the Cthulhu mythos, you can easily see the similarities. Eternal Darkness is yet another horror game inspired by Lovecraftian horror, but Eternal Darkness also includes elements of Edgar Allan Poe, myth, occultism, religion, and fancy things like that. Also, the game is a sleeper hit, check it out. The Last of Us was inspired by The Road, as well as City of Thieves. Also, modern day God of War is also inspired by The Road. The last game I want to mention is Spec Ops The Line. Terrible name, I know. But Spec Ops The Line is a very special game from stem to stern. Spec Ops is unwavering in its commitment to the idea that not only is the protagonist of the military shooter a sociopath, but that our demand for enjoyment of them reveals something deeply ugly about us and our culture. Anyways, the game takes inspiration from Heart of Darkness by renowned author Joseph Conrad. Now that we have a deeper understanding of where some of these games came from and how they were made, what exactly is the point of this video? Well, I would just say I find it interesting that there aren't many more direct one-to-one -one faithful adaptations of games and their novel counterparts. Most games either just expand on the lore or were entirely reworked for better or for worse. I mean, who's to say, really? But I still believe that there is true potential within this niche. Bear with me for a second. We've seen great game-to-book adaptations, reimaginings of games as books, and even expanded universe content that range from pretty fucking great to... Uh... Imagine a full-fledged Lord of the Rings trilogy, PlayStation-exclusive tier graphics and acting, and a different playstyle for different characters. Imagine The Hobbits as to be more of like a stealth playstyle, creeping around their way to Mordor. Meanwhile, while playing characters like Aragorn and Legolas could have a more, say, God of War style system of combat. I know what I'm proposing would be expensive as all hell, and honestly, we don't even need a we don't even need a game like this. The books and movies are more than fine on their own, but you have to admit, it's a pretty cool idea. Piggybacking off of that, imagine a one-to-one -one Dune adaptation in video game form. I mean, just look at the shield, the combat, the Dune worm, the voice. All these things could fit perfectly within a video game. The medium is perfect, and though things would have to change to make these stories more game-like, I still would like to see more things come out of this. I mean, we've gotten great book versions of video games that do them justice. The same love could be reciprocated the other way around. I would also like to point out that I'm actually more for original video game ideas than I am of rehashes of things that we already have. That's not to say I don't like my licensed games. I love Jedi Fallen Order and Spider-Man, but holy shit are licensed IPs fucking everywhere nowadays. I don't know what the moral of the story is. I, I just figured I'd make a video about the subject, but it's whatever. Now, if you liked what you saw today, please consider showing your support by liking the video and possibly subscribing. Hell, if you want to share it with your friends too, that'd be great. Your support would honestly mean the world to me, but Enough of that. I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care. I would also like to point out a special thanks to my friends, uh, Sari Parker, Xavier Zellner, and uh, uh, Caesar Carbohol. They're, they're, they're awesome. You guys want to come out? Come on. Come on. This, this godforsaken project. Hello. It was all worth it, and it was, it was all because of these guys. So thank you. Thank you. Anything? You did great. Good job. Thank you. 